all of Christianity, all of Islam, all of Judaism in the Eastern countries, Buddhism and Hinduism were involved in it too. It is indeed what was called by a great abolitionist, the great black abolitionist of the 18th century, Olaude Keanu, called it the dirty business. That indeed is what it was. My focus is on Latin America and West Africa. Marsha and Patty, who are better known to you as Professor Patty Friedrich and Professor Marsha Fazio, have focuses which are not mine, thank God, because if I had to listen to myself three times, it would be horrific. <laughs> We're going to open this up. My focus is New World. Marsha, back there, wave a hand, Marsha, because of Marsha Fazio, is going to talk about this rather hideous, dirty business in the Mediterranean and Europe. Marsha Fazio is professor of Renaissance literature and linguistics here. Uh, at the West Campus, those of you who have not taken a class with her, please do so now. <laughs> Professor Patty Friedrich, please wave a hand. Patty is also the assistant director of the School of Humanities and Arts. So is it Arts and Humanities? Humanities, Arts and Culture. Humanities, Arts and Culture. And Professor of Linguistics. And Patty is going to give us a fascinating insight into the effects of slavery on language itself. So, before we begin, as we're going right into the introduction, let me just say to you that when that abolitionist, Olaude Keanu, at the end of the 18th century, was living in England by that point as a free man, and he wrote his autobiography at the ripe old age of 44, Olaude said, and by the way, I have the autobiography here with me after, after the, I almost said after class, we're so used to teaching, after the symposium, I'll be happy to show it to you, because it's a magnificent work of literature that really should be part of American literature as well. By the way, it's studied in England for the A-levels and the O-levels, where it's simply considered a masterpiece of British literature, so it'll be about time, maybe that we did something like that with Frederick Douglass's Up From Slavery here in the United States. But Olaue Piano says at the end of his autobiography that the one thing that he will never forget, he said, the dirtiest memory, again, this word dirty, because slavery is the dirty business, it's the dark side of the Renaissance, the dirtiest memory I have, Olaue said, was that of Portuguese, English, and Spanish slave traders sealing the pact with the Yoruba slave traders Yoruba being a very important nation in what is now Nigeria. Olaude was from another nation called the Igbo. They sealed the pact and they shook hands while they ripped my sister from me. This was the dirty business of European slave traders and African slave traders. Is it true that the African kings did not know into what they were selling? Their prisoners of war? No, they knew very well. And we know that from a very ugly archive in Spain called the Archive of the Indies because, ooh, Imperial Spain, this is where, and Imperial Portugal, this is where the black slave trade begins. And they knew very well into what they were selling their own people because every five years, roughly, the Spanish and the Portuguese would come back for a new shipment of slaves. Do you realize that that means that the average lifespan of a black slave in the New World was about five years. So you're talking about something beyond hideous. So let me say this at the very beginning, before I begin. This is long before I begin, isn't it? <laughs> I am in no way insinuating, and please do not anybody interpret it this way, that because there was very active African participation in the slave trade, that that means that black slaves did not go through something particularly horrible in the New World. On the contrary. Their situation was the worst of anyone in the colonized New World. And the rather horrible paradigm of racial prejudice, which continues to this day, has its roots in this time that we call the Renaissance. I will add, not but and, there were also many other victims of slavery, which in no way 
takes away from the issue of black slaves. Okay, just to make this very clear, I like throwing things out as I say in Spanish, sin tapujos. Okay, with no, no breaks, or sin pelos en la lengua, which is translated horribly into English as without hairs on your tongue. <laughs> If we talk about the Holocaust, I am Jewish, I'm a Spanish Jew, I'm a Sephardic Jew. Obviously, I care about the Jews killed in the Holocaust. It in no way takes away from the story of the Jews killed in the Holocaust if I talk about gypsies killed in the Holocaust, if I talk about two and a half million anti-Nazi Germans killed in the Holocaust. The Holocaust and slavery are two subjects which tend to get more and more horrible the more you speak about them. So I am not in any way, shape, or form, diminishing anyone's suffering. In fact, by the time you walk out of here, you might be ready to walk off a cliff <laughs> because the story is worse and worse the more that we know about it. And now, as I begin, I'm just going to recommend one book to you all. Please read it. It is written by a magnificent historian at Cornell University, and it is called The Half That's Never Been Told. The Half That's Never Been Told, by Edward Baptiste, okay, looks like Baptist with an E. And Kendra is signaling me to get within view, <laughs> you got my voice for sure. Um, so now, that's right, if you haven't had enough of this live, Kendra puts this on our website, so you can go back and, if you forgot a historical fact, listen to it again. That book by Edward Baptiste, The Half That's Never Been Told, is absolutely the most searing exploration of slavery, beginning with the horrific story of black slavery and including lesser known and equally horrific stories of Irish and poor English bondsmen sold into slavery in the West Indies, and women, because here we go folks, women, black or white, are always the first and foremost victims of any form of military brutality. So back in the Renaissance, now let's start. Also, and I wanted to give a little extra time for people to come. What a magnificent showing. Thank you so much for coming, because this is an important subject. And God knows when we talk about current issues, not to know the history of slavery means that we will keep on repeating the same problems over and over. So I'm now going to talk, to talk for 20 minutes, um, beyond what I've already said. You get another 20 minutes where I'm going to try to give you an overall picture of slavery in the West Indies and Latin America in the time called the Renaissance. I keep on saying the time called the Renaissance. It was a great time in Italy. There were magnificent artists. There was Michelangelo. There was Da Vinci. It is, there is a Renaissance during this period. But to call the whole period of the Renaissance is rather harsh, because this period from the late 15th through the late 18th century saw the most massive transportation of human beings <clears throat> against their will in that very notorious middle passage from Africa to the New World. If we total up the records, and people, there are very meticulous records kept by whom? by the slave traders on both sides. That means primarily the African kings of Ghana and Angola and Nigeria, where there were three different kingdoms that were involved in the slave trade, and of course the people who most benefited from it, Imperial Europe. This was the age of empire. So Spain and England and Portugal kept very meticulous records, and we're not even going to have the time to talk about England and Holland and France and everyone else. We'll do a follow-up to the seminar and then we'll talk about them. For the time being, I'm going to start where it begins, in Latin America. So, in 1492, Columbus arrives in what we will call, what he will call, well, he called it Asia, and then later on it was called the New World a site of many ancient civilizations, and the first people enslaved by Imperial Spain, because Columbus flew, of course, under the flag of Imperial Spain, are the Arawak and Taino Indians of the West Indies. Have any of you ever visited Jamaica, Barbados, all those beautiful, beautiful islands in the Caribbean? 
it's kind of shocking to realize that these incredibly beautiful beaches of the Caribbean were the site of what a very, very great anti-Nazi German political leader, Willy Brandt, called the first genocide of the New World. This is where it begins, in the Caribbean. And by the time you get to the middle of the 16th century, Spanish colonialism has been so harsh that the native populations of the islands of the Caribbean, the Taino Indians, have been exterminated by nine-tenths. Now, I don't want to tell you there is no Native American population in the Caribbean. That is rubbish that is frequently repeated when you watch crazy documentaries on the History Channel, which you should only watch when you don't want to know history. Um, yes, there are small pockets. Thank God something survived, particularly on the island of Dominica. There is actually a small Carib Indian population that survived slavery. Um, but most did not. And most were completely, completely destroyed. If they were not destroyed, they were then forcibly assimilated into Spanish colonial civilization. And so while over 60% of everybody born in the Caribbean, white or black, has Taino Indian background, unfortunately we can say that definitely by the beginning of the 17th century, the culture has been utterly exterminated. Okay, if not all the people, the culture has been utterly exterminated, and many of the people have been as well. To the extent that in 1537, the Pope had to issue a bull, for those of you who aren't familiar with this phrase, the papal bulla, okay, or declaration as it's called, issued in 1537 called Sublimis Deus, Sublime God, which was actually the Pope screaming at the Spanish Empire, saying, whether you like it or not, Native Americans are human beings. And they cannot and should not be enslaved. That sounds wonderful, except Africans did not get the same treatment. At all. At all. And after most of the native population, most of the Taino and Arawak Indian population of the West Indies had been culturally destroyed. And I'm going to keep on using that because I do want you to remember that 60% of the entire Caribbean population has Arawak and Taino Indian roots. But they are culturally destroyed by the early part of the 16th century already. Then the one solution everyone agrees on, and here's where it begins, that dirtiest of all dirty businesses, is let's ship out Africans. And then we have a country which often has a reputation for being nicer than Spain. No country is nice, people. Anytime you form a nation state, it's the same rubbish. You have to go back to tribalism. Nation states are nasty, always. That's Portugal. People often say, oh, but the Portuguese were, they were softer imperialists than the Spanish. We are going to have to tell that to roughly four million Africans who they transported into Brazil at the early part of the 16th century because the native population of Brazil, the Guarani population, was much less numerous, say, than the Aztecs in Mexico. Mm, or the Inca and the Moche in Peru, or the Maya in Central America. And so early on, the Portuguese, who officially get to Brazil in 1500, and possibly had showed up before, see, we need what we call in Spanish mano de obra. We need cheap labor. We desperately need cheap labor. Let's get it from West Africa, because the Portuguese already have a very important colony in West Africa. Have any of you, do any of you remember, go back to grade school, those of you who are 18, those of you who are 18 plus, learning about the explorers, remember Vasco da Gama, and, and you know, the way it's taught to you when you're in fourth grade is wonderful. I wish it had been that fun. You know, the explorers set out on their beautiful ships, and there they go around the Cape of Good Hope, you know, in Africa, and they tell you that the main reason for those voyages was slavery. 
So the Portuguese had a very strong presence already in West Africa. And the kings of Angola now join in this dirty business. So were there blacks involved in the slave trade? Yes. There were blacks, there were whites, there were Chinese. There was everybody. Don't try to find one nationality or one religion that escapes from this. We are all literally in the same cesspool with this. Okay, and I emphasize this, people, because, you know, history, history exists. There are objective facts, but depending upon who writes the history, well, I lived for 10 years in Israel. So I got to look at history written by Israelis and history written by Arabs. And the Arabs always point out that there were Jews involved in the slave trade. And the Jews always point out there were Arabs involved in the slave trade. And we would both point out there were Christians involved in the slave trade. Slave trade. And the only problem is we're all right. Everybody was involved. Everybody. Don't think you're going to find more or less among any, among any culture or any people. This is where humanity really has to hang its head in shame. And the kings of Angola saw a wonderful opportunity because in Africa it was common, just as it was in Europe, to take prisoners of war as slaves. You know that slavery existed in the medieval period in Europe as well. That was the same way it existed in Africa. Is it right to say that the African slave trade was less harsh than the European slave trade? Well, the greatest living American historian, who is an African American and teaches at Harvard, and if you all don't know his name, you should also be ashamed. All right? Henry Louis Gates. Keep your eyes open for him and for his work, because Henry Louis Gates gives a punch to everybody on this subject. He punches white, he punches black, he punches yellow. And when he went to West Africa, in the country of Senegal, which also will join in this trade after Angola, he visited a particular tribe called the Dengue, who were particularly involved in kidnapping other Africans and selling them to the Portuguese, and later to the English. And Henry Louis Gates asked the current members of the tribe, and it Think about this. He's asking them as an African-American, as the recipient of what has been a horrific racism in this country. Do you regret having done that? And you know what they said? No. And this is exactly what the king of Spain, Juan Carlos, yeah, this king of Spain, not the nasty ones 500 years ago, the current one, well, he's no longer the current one. Now we have his son, Felipe. So his father, Juan Carlos, I grew up with Juan Carlos there in the palace. When Juan Carlos was asked about this, what was his response? He said exactly what the members of the Dengue tribe said. Well, it was so long ago. Hmm. Well, I've got news for you. If you're an African American, it wasn't that long ago. If you're Irish and you were sold into slavery by the English in Barbados, it wasn't that long ago. In fact, if you're a human being, it wasn't that long ago. And Henry Louis Gates, you know, he, he found this quite interesting. He said it's really fascinating. After everything that's happened, you still don't regret it. And he told him, he said, you're giving me the same response I heard in Europe. He said, you know, I actually know far more white Americans who are really annoyed at this issue than I found in either Europe or Africa. Interesting. Okay, I just throw that out to you as something to think about. But in Latin America, we often say, we have no color barrier. That's rubbish. You can visit any Latin American country, and you will find that the upper class is always white. Okay, so to say that there is no color prejudice in Latino culture is absolute nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. And look at the ruling classes in every single country. Tell me how many black or indigenous people we find among them. Because this system begins in the 16th century with the collaboration of the kings of West Africa and becomes a booming business and it sets a social structure. And black slaves are taken, sold by black slave traders in Angola and Senegal to the Portuguese, later to the Spanish who have this terrible problem they've already depleted most of the native population in the countries they've conquered, so we need to bring in the black slaves. And 
And what does the church do? The same church that guaranteed that native people have souls turned a blind eye and participated actively in the black slave trade. Now, this current pope has apologized for that. This current pope is a, a fine man. And I dearly wish somebody like this current pope had been in power 500 years ago. But that was not the case. And that was not the case in the 15th, 16th, 17th, or 18th century. And don't worry, when Northern Europe becomes Protestant, it also joins in that slave trade. And North African Muslim traders joined in that slave trade. And much as I hate to admit it, some of my Sephardic Jewish ancestors joined in that slave trade. Everybody was involved in that slave trade. And so, when you visit the island of Jamaica, and you ask them, what do you feel about Africa and about Europe, the Jamaicans tell you, same, mm, different day. Why? Because they're right. Because in the West Indies, into these horrific sugarcane factories where the average lifespan, I repeat this, of a slave, whether it was 90% of them African or 10% of them Irish, poor English, because by the way, if you were lower class English and an indentured servant, you also got thrown off. Or... Sephardic Jewish, or Muslim Spanish, and your own people were also selling you into slavery. Your background comes from all of that. Are any of you familiar with somebody who was a very great reggae singer named Bob Marley? So Bob Marley always used to joke about all the green eyes he had in his family. <laughs> and what was he speaking about? He was speaking about the fact that as every Jamaican knows, as every Barbadian knows, as a very fine Jamaican writer, Colin Channer has said, when you look at the history of the West Indies, and you look at the history of Latin America, and let's add to this North America, you will see something that is so ugly in terms of mass participation <coughs> that whatever group you're trying to romanticize, you will not be able to. By the time you get to the 18th century, Five more minutes and I'm going to tell you the worst facts. There is a romanticized view that slavery gets lighter and less arduous and there's less of it as the centuries progress. Have any of you ever heard that? If you, if you listen sometimes to revisionist Confederate works from the American South, they're often fond of saying that. Oh, but there were less slaves imported. Let's kill that one historically right now. The importation of slavery increases, I repeat, increases in Spanish America, Portuguese America, and illegally in both English and French speaking America in the 18th century. Do you understand? The closer you actually get to what will in this country become a bloody abolition of slavery, in Latin America, what will become an equally bloody abolition of slavery because it will be abolished violently by South American patriots in the 19th century. And in Brazil, what will be we, the longest time we had to wait for the abolition of slavery, 1888. Well, let's not get on a high horse in this country. It was 1863. And then most of those slaves here were not granted civil rights till a year after the Beatles invaded the Remember our voting right, Rights Act, 1965, in 22 American states? If you were of African American descent, you couldn't vote till a year after the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. That's okay. So don't point the finger at Brazil. As Henry Louis Gates says in this business, we're all pointing fingers at everybody else. Yeah, because everybody's stained, everyone is dirty. If you follow the numbers of slave importations and the business deals made between the Spanish crown, the English crown, the Portuguese crown, the French crown, and let's add the Dutch. There is a marked increase in importation of slaves in the second half of the 18th century, surpassing anything in all previous centuries put together. 
Okay, where am I taking this information from? From the same place you can take it from, from the slave archives. From the archives in the British Library of the slave trade, which run from 1572, so God knows how much illegal stuff went on before that, all right? From 1572 on to the official abolition of slavery in 1804, from the notorious Archivo de las Indias in Sevilla, in Spain, which runs from 1499 till slavery and the Inquisition were abolished in 1813 by the Patriot San Martin in Argentina, in 1819 by the Patriot Simon Bolivar in the northern part of Latin America. There's the information. It's ugly information. It's like reading an accounting sheet. Because people are turned into pawns, and that is something that I know Marsha and Patty will also elaborate on. One more minute. <coughs> By the end of what we call the Bourbon period, los Borbones in Spain, most of Latin America, and by the end of Portugal's period of the gold period, which is when gold is discovered in Brazil actually at the end of the 17th century, so more slaves are shipped in to Brazil during the 18th century. Understand that in both Brazil, the Portuguese-speaking part of Latin America, by the way, it is the biggest part of Latin America, so please remember that, and the Spanish-speaking part of Latin America, and the West Indies. More slaves are imported in the final 50 years of the 18th century than in all preceding centuries. Does this mean slavery is getting less? Does this mean it's diminished? In no way. And the final proof, people, is a group of laws called, in Spanish, las leyes negras, the black laws, which are adopted enthusiastically. First, promulgated in Spain, adopted by Portugal, and then adopted, this isn't only an issue of the Catholic empires, adopted in Protestant England, Protestant Holland, and mixed Protestant and Catholic France, and these laws will apply to all slaves, black and white. So whether you were an African prisoner, or whether you were a poor Irishman or woman who couldn't pay their debts, because by the way, folks, there's a massive importation of Irish women and children into the West Indies at the end of the 18th century. In all those cases, those black laws applied to you, and those black laws were worse than any laws in the early 16th century. So, it's a horrible way to start the, uh, the talk, but this is a difficult talk. We are not going to be speaking about easy subjects. And so we understand that as the writer, the, as he's called in England, the great English writer, notice that in England they, they're not making a distinction of him as a black writer, right? In the United States we would automatically say African American. He's just considered an English writer. And he was black, and he was a slave, and he managed to obtain his freedom in a very difficult way. As Olauda Ekiano said, this business, this business, the dirtiest of all businesses. I'm now going to turn over this very dirty business. You see, I was equally dirty in Europe, from the New World to the Old, Professor Marshall Fazio. I'm going to ferret out the roles ethnicity, religion, and ancestry played in early Mediterranean slavery. As I look at a segment of slavery, a segment of slavery history on the Italian peninsula to explore how one slave society internalized the concept and practice of holding other human beings in bondage. In a world where enslavement of human beings was socially, culturally, politically, economically sanctioned, where Barbary pirates captured and enslaved thousands of European Christians, every year, where European colonizers enslaved masses of New World indigenous peoples, and where trading slaves was big business. 
We can say that during the early modern period, um, approximately 1300 to 1700, just about everybody was trying to enslave someone. Slavery, as we know, is nothing new. From antiquity through our own day, slavery has been alive and, and well. Uh, having presented itself over the course of history in varying degrees all over the globe. From the Aztecs and Mayans, Sumerians and Babylonians, slaves were recognized as constituting a separate segment of society. Um, and this stratification was, well, it's clearly outlined in the major texts of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. As late as the 19th century, we find that one third of imperial of the imperial Russian population uh, were serfs, considered slaves, since they could be bought and sold, and had the status of chattels, providing forced and unpaid labor. And the abolition of slavery has had as long and tortuous a past as had the practice of slavery from decrees dating back to the Chinese Qin Dynasty of the 3rd century BC up until the first years of the 21st century when Mauritania and Niger made slaveholding a crime, we can follow the cultural, economic, religious, and moral anxieties bound up with the practice of slavery. As well in Africa, chattel slavery existed long before the onset of organized slave trade. Dr. Akuran Pari, in his Ending the Slavery Blame Game, confirms the notion that enslavers looked upon their enslaved as not a part of the master strata. For example, in the case of Asante rulers, uh, who sold not Asantes into slavery, believing that they were not Africans. Likewise, in the early Middle Ages and early modern era in Europe, uh, enslavement was condoned as long as the slaves were non-Christians. Perry also cites Christian Scandinavians and Russians who sold their captured war enemies to Abbasid Caliphate in the early Middle Ages, believing they weren't placing their fellow Europeans into slavery. Historical evidence shows that existing cultures, mores, and practices sustaining one person's dominion over another was a worldwide phenomenon, uh, not completely erased by any means today. I wanted to, before I uh, begin again, I wanted to get to the next slide because I, I wanted to mention that throughout history, the enslaved belonged to a distinct group. The others, those human beings in classifications other than those of the enslavers. And I'm, I'm going to use the term alterity, which I borrowed from the realms of anthropology and philosophy to refer to the human mindset that allows us to classify a group of people, whether by social class, race, ethnicity, or gender, in order to mark similarities and differences among human beings. This system of classification acts like a, a screening process and places a division between the two groups, a process that precedes one group's denial of another group's humanity, or at least equal humanity, allowing the dominant group to limit status and deny choice of the marked group. The inherent unequal power exchange informs the commodity exchange, the buying and selling of individuals. 
We find in our exploration of slavery in the Mediterranean, even those people who had been persecuted and enslaved themselves, often participating in, in slave trade. And I'm going to focus on Italy, birthplace of the Renaissance, providing an illuminating example of how human beings internalize the phenomenon of slavery as we attempt to understand how color, race, religion, and ancestry interact with power, economy, politics, and culture on both sides of the Mediterranean, looking at slaveholding and trading in the predominant city-states of the Italian peninsula. And although slaves never constituted a significant population on the peninsula, slavery and slave trade took hold in the dominant Italian city-states, especially in the 14th century um, after the bubonic plague epidemic. In the wealthy city-states, the Black Death wiped out most of the workforce, uh, not, not to mention half of the populations of Florence, Venice, and, and Genoa. Uh, but not only this deficit of laborers accounted for the increase in slave trade, but also the flourishing of commerce between Italian merchants and the growing Ragusan dynasties, now, now Croatia, um, and the Balkan hinterland. So Italy provided wool, food products, wheat, in exchange for slaves, most of whom were young women. Only 10% were men, and all of whom belonged to either the Paterine or Orthodox faith. The former were considered heretics. The latter schismatics, that is, those who broke from the Roman Church. Both groups permitted by the Roman Church to be legitimately enslaved. In fact, it was after the agreement to separate the Venetian Republic from the Byzantine Empire in the 9th century uh, that Venice's profitable slave trading peaked. Venetian merchants would buy slaves on the selling blocks all along the Adriatic mainly captured non-Roman Christians and Muslims from Eastern Europe, called Slavs. Hence, the word slave. From medieval sclavos, eventually sclavos, and uh, finally in the 14th century, Dante used the word schiavo in the Florentine dialect that was to become the national language of Italy. In, in the 20th century, Nazi Germany revived the idea of Slavs are slaves when they invaded Poland in 1939, and in their uh, term for Russians, Czechs, and other Eastern European peoples. That term was Untermensch, which means subhuman. Getting back to the early modern era, in most of Europe, society was based on class divide. That is, lower classes working the land for the upper classes, while slaves were predominantly subjugated through the capture and purchase of others. Uh, that is, persons born and raised in other societies of other religions. The church, although advocating that slave owners be forgiving and understanding, upheld the right of one human being to own another. Clerics themselves often possess slaves. Faith-based enslavement of the other mirrored the religious boundaries of Italian society itself and, and therefore defined the parameters within which Italians viewed slavery through the lens of uh, their own societal norms. Slavery, for example, was contemptible when Christians were enslaved by Jews, Muslims, or infidels. Notary records that we look at, however, show something a little different. That is, they reveal, these records reveal, that even these considerations could be trumped by commercial interest. The ethnic origins of slaves brought into Italy were carefully recorded in, in these documents. Uh, most Italian city-states very carefully recorded. Um, with ethnic origins such as Tartar, Abghazi, Circassian, Bulgarian, Russian, Turkish, Greek, Mingreli, uh, those were the ethnic terms most often used 
in these records of slave sales and importations during the 14th and 15th centuries. Um, they were the ethnic groups that bordered the Black and Aegean Sea. Oh my God. Is that right? Okay. Um, a person's religion was inferred from his or her place of origin and ancestry. Establishing an ethno-religious basis in early Italian slave trade rather than a race-based uh, determination of slave status. But still, Venetian merchants, along with those of Genoa in northern Italy, bought sub-Saharan Africans from Muslim merchants. Only a small minority, however, of the total slave population uh, of northern Italian city-states consisted of black Africans with a more pronounced um, presence in Sicily and Naples. century, a desire, especially among the royalty of European courts, to possess the novel and exotic fostered the importation of black African slaves. Nobles such as Isabella d'Este, a great art collector, and known in her own time as first woman of the world, uh, purchased black children, servants, and retainers in a desire to possess what was considered special and exotic. There are numerous examples in Renaissance art that testify to the color-coded model of subordination. Um, and as art historian Paul Kaplan so aptly put it, Isabella d'Este worked closely with the great Renaissance painter Andrea Mantegna, uh, ordering what she liked to have him paint. Here, for example, are three of the, the many works of uh, Mantegna depicting the biblical account of Judith beheading Holofernes, who was the Assyrian general come to wipe out Judith's, Judith's village. Uh, Judith is accompanied by her maidservant, whose race or ethnicity is never mentioned in the story, a story that ends with Judith freeing her handmaiden. Uh, thereby clarifying that the servant was, in fact, a slave. Uh, the, 19, the 1492 ink drawing in the center of the slide is said to be the first depiction of a black African servant with Judith. of ancestry and religion is, um, no, this is not the slide. Okay, here you can see two more important uh, paintings from the 16th century showing black African domestic slaves collaborating with their female owner, the revered and courageous Judith. Here we go. Okay. Um, illustrating the importance of ancestry and religion is uh, the 16th century portrait by Jacobo Contorno, and it shows the aristocratic widow of Giovanni de' Medici. Her name is Maria Salviati. She's the mother of Cosimo de' Medici, who is Grand Duke of Tuscany. And here she is uh, painted with her young ward, Giulia. She, Giulia is a Medici relative. Giulia's father, Alessandro, was the illegitimate son of a liaison between the Medici Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who later became Pope Clement VII, and his African servant. The lines between races are often blurred. Uh, Alessandro de' Medici was a Florentine, 
And in Florence, if the father recognized the illegitimate child, the legal status of the child was then tied to the father. So thereby rendering little Julia free status. Her patrician ancestry, rather than her racial heritage, uh, accounted for her free status. But not all black Africans living in Italian cities were necessarily slaves. Here we go. Uh, in Venice, for example, the gondolier we see in Vittorio Carpaccio's famous painting might have been manumitted by his master, or maybe he was a child of a freed slave. Manumission, an act by masters to legally free slaves, was not a rare occurrence, owners often leaving in their last will and testament the condition that a slave be freed. Dating back to the 13th century, Venetian law prohibited, this is exact, sons of women of low and vile condition to be put up for seats in the Great Council. Addressing a growing problem in 1492, this law was amplified now specifically stating that illegitimate sons by slave women could not be put up for membership in this elite political group. So at least one patrician did attempt to enroll his son by a slave woman. The slaveholders in the early modern Mediterranean considered ancestral origin skin color, gender, and age, but prime focus was on religion, which in many cases served to legitimize bondage. The papacy recognized that enslaved people who converted to Christianity after their enslavement were in fact legitimately enslaved. Additionally, the papal states and other Italian cities aligned with Rome prohibited the enslavement of people residing in countries whose rulers recognized the supremacy of the Pope. The papacy, however, was to ignore these considerations, as Sharon mentioned, in Latin America, actively participating in New World African slave trade. Italian traders, along with Catalans, Turks, and the Emirates of Asia Minor, converged in market ports throughout the Black and Aegean Seas, looking for commodities, grains, uh, salt fish, cow hides, and slaves. Both Christian and non-Christian merchants participated in this commerce. Particularly young females were in high demand during the 14th and 15th centuries in the major Italian city-states. As domestic servants, uh, they would perform household chores, cooking, cleaning, laundry, etc., functioning as well to satisfy the sexual needs of masters and sons, the sons often marrying, uh, typically marrying late in life, ignoring statutes that, uh, statutes that prohibited sexual exploitation of slaves. They also served as wet nurses who could be rented out at a good rate to other families, a profitable transaction and in the case of the wet nurses, we, we should note that neither race nor ethnic origins were of any importance. Um, what was important to these uh, patrician and upper class families was the health and youth of the slave. As Italian merchants lost access to important trade routes and the maritime decline of the Venetian Republic uh, had taken its toll. Domestic slavery in Italy uh, by the 16th century had actually significant, significantly declined. And furthermore, in northern Italy, uh, free women and men and children from the hinterlands of large cities and the Balkans uh, could be hired as cheap paid labor. Holding slaves became out of fashion considered an extravagance uh, throughout most of the Italian peninsula, practically disappearing by the 17th century. Um, but as the Atlantic <coughs> slave trade began to dominate, both Christians and Muslims alike sanctioned and participated in slave commerce.
Um, enslavement was acceptable to European Christians, but on the opposite side of the Mediterranean, when Barbary corsairs <coughs> captured and enslaved Christians, uh, of course the rules changed. Europeans paid high ransoms to secure the freedom of their fellow Christians, uh, captured by Barbary pirates who came to dominate the seas, uh, endangering commerce of Christian merchants, threatening every coastal town and island in the Mediterranean. The question uh, that I came up with, and I, I'm sure that you're probably uh, asking is, uh, some form of this question, what, what sort of cognitive dissonance could justify holding slaves in one situation, but not another? I found that uh, concerning Christian and, much, and Muslim regions on um, opposite banks of the Mediterranean, and on both sides of the issue of reciprocal tra uh, slavery, there's tension among scholars. One side insists that too little has been written about white slavery in the Barbary, uh, while the other side claims not enough research of North African and Muslim slavery has been done. What shines through, for me, though, however, is that Mediterranean Eastern European Catholics and Protestants, Muslims, Jews, and Orthodox Christians languished in bondage, a condition condoned by Catholics Protestant, Muslim, Jewish, and Orthodox religions. A historian, Robert Davis, in his seminal work, Christian Slaves, Muslim Masters, calculates that more than one million Europeans between 1530 and 1786 were abducted by North African pirates. These corsairs Sailing with permits from the Ottoman regencies of the Maghreb, that would be Tunis, Algiers, Tripoli, uh, launched night raids, capturing sleeping Sicilians, for example, taken by surprise and hauled on to pirate ships for transport to one of the numerous trading centers of the Ottoman Empire. In fact, Sicilians still, to this day, have the expression pillato dai turchi, pillato dai turchi, which means taken by the Turks, taken by Turks, uh, meaning to be caught by surprise while not paying attention. Enslaved men, 10% uh, of whom had to be given to the ruling pashas, were kept in the now famous baños, uh, or warehouses, where those who would work in the quarries, construction, or on the galley ships uh, were housed. The condition of these uh, baños, documented by freed slaves, most notably Miguel Cervantes, uh, and written sources brought back to Europe describe brutal conditions uh, with no checks in place to deter severe cruelty. Survivors of the Baños tell that they were not only considered as property, uh, but also infidels. I infidels. Uh, taking the turban, a, uh, as conversion was referred to, uh, was one way of lessening the impact and highly preached against by the ever-present number of priests and clerics and clergymen who were uh, captives. <coughs> Stephen Clissold, who's author of The Barbary Slaves, as well as Robert Davis, insists that no laws were in place to guard against extreme cruelty by uh, Muslim slave owners. And the fact that Christian slaves were cheap and plentiful and easily replaced <coughs> fostered the ill treatment of captives. On the other hand, Ariel Salzman, professor of Islamic history at Queen's University in Ontario, in her article, Ottoman Expressions of Early Modernity, highlights that uh, enforced slavery of Muslims was a form of coerced migration, acknowledging that there's no doubt that faith played a determining role in the forced transfer of populations, and claiming that Muslim law insisted on humane treatment of captives, as they were called. Uh, I think the only way to conclude my talk, which I hope is going to generate a lot of questions and comments, is in the spirit of the great Primo Levi, who in his remarkable Sequesto en Uomo, that is, uh, If This is a Man, an account of his confinement in Auschwitz, 
attempts to quietly study the depths of the human mind, captive and captor alike. He posits that thinking every stranger is an enemy is at the root of the infection, ultimately responsible for the concentration camps, and I would add, by extension, for the enslavement of one human being by another. I'm going to end by telling you what Primo Levi overhears one day after roll call in the Auschwitz. He heard the camp marshal ask his corporal, how many? He heard the corporal's reply, 650 pieces. I end on that. Um, shared with you today uh, and focus a little bit on the linguistic aspect of uh, uh, slavery and how that impacts language as we use um, today. So I'm going to start with a couple of items, uh, a couple of terms that I hope will be familiar to you by the end of the presentation. The first one is the idea of pidgin languages. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but um, pidgin languages are usually simplified versions of language used for immediate communication. Um, they develop many times in situations of trade or in colonial plantations. And some of the reasons why they developed uh, might be intuitive to you. People of different backgrounds had to communicate with one another, um, even though it was a situation of incredible linguistic violence and violence of all sorts. There's this push towards communication. And many times, not only that, but people who were brought into the plantations as slaves, they were brought from different groups different linguistic groups in an attempt for them to not get together and plot against slave owners, right? Um, but the push for communication, and this is one of the wonderful aspects of language, the push for communication is so strong that even when people do not share a linguistic background, they find words, and that's how pidgin languages are created. So basically they are simplified uh, versions of language they have no native speakers, so nobody speaks uh, pidgin as their first language, um, but they are functional, and they work for immediate communication between uh, parties. Um, there's limit, limited lexicon, and lexicon is just a fancy linguistic word for vocabulary, and so in pidgin languages, you have only the bare necessities of things that are immediately relevant for that environment of communication. So it's hard to represent very abstract thought, but you can talk about everyday things in very simplified ways. Uh, there's limited situations of use for pidgin uh, languages because they are designed for immediate communication in very practical situations. Um, and the interesting thing about pidgins is that they can develop into Creole languages, which is what we're going to see next, or they can die out if the uses for which they were first created become irrelevant, or they can remain a pigeon for as long as that situation of communication needs to take place. <clears throat> the prestige of pigeons is very low, in part because they have no written tradition, um, because they have no native speakers to advocate for them, and also because they are used in these situations that are uh, you know, not related to education of, or government, or one of the things that really gives status to a language. There's great variation. Uh, each person might be trying to use it in a different lay, way, and there is uh, very low standardization. You cannot say, you know, like we do with English, that we say, do not uh, end the sentence with a preposition or do not split your infinitives. It would be very difficult to make that kind of uh, comment or request when you're talking about a pidgin language. And there's usually no literary tradition for not writing poems and books and stories in pidgin language. So it's really very immediate for immediate communication purposes. The reasons why I started this talk talking about pigeons might be obvious to you, right? You have uh, European uh, slave owners, and I'm, I'm particularly focusing on Latin America, uh, who all of a sudden have to communicate with slaves who have very little power and control over their situation and 
who spoke languages such as Yoruba or Igbo, and now are in contact with uh, languages brought from Europe. And so from that attempt at communication, pigeons are born. But some pigeons, and quite a few of them, <coughs> develop into creoles. And one of the things that marks that transition from pigeon to creole is that all of a sudden you have native speakers. You have children being born into the language and speaking it as a first language. So you can imagine what happens if you, uh, if you use something as a first language, you need uh, to expand your vocabulary so that you can fulfill all of the needs that you might have linguistically. Not only to express immediate needs, but also to talk about feelings, to talk about emotions, about wants, about the future, about the past. And with that, the language grows. Um, usually in Creoles, you have what we call a lexifier language, which is the language that provides most of the vocabulary. And then we have one or more other languages that provide the syntax, the pronunciation, and whatnot. Is this a fast rule that somebody said, you know, if you're going to create a Creole, this is how you're going to have to go about it. Choose a lexifier language, and then choose all the other bases. No, that's not how it works. This is, this is a, a natural dynamics of language. So those of you who try to learn a foreign language, vocabulary is the easy part, isn't it? You know, those people who go and say, I know 3,000 words in Italian. I know 4,000 words in French. And then they get to the supermarket and go, right? Because vocabulary alone does not communicative competence make. And it is a lot easier for you to impose your vocabulary on somebody else than to impose pronunciation, syntax, and whatnot, right? <coughs> Um, I've been in this country 20 years, and I, the vocabulary is right there with the pronunciation. I, as you can probably tell, the little Brazilian is, is still there um, from time to time. And so the lexifier language is usually one of the European languages in these uh, contexts of slavery. And the, the other languages um, provide the syntax, the pronunciation, and incredible linguistic creativity. But it doesn't have to necessarily be two languages. Sometimes it's two or more languages that get together. Okay? And the point that I want to emphasize and that names this talk is that in this situation of incredible violence, linguistic, cultural, physical, and whatnot, there is linguistic solidarity. And if you think of the European languages as the one with power, you can think of the pigeons and creoles as the ones that demonstrate this solidarity, you know, this sense of belonging, this sense of identity. To, to the speakers. Okay. So now putting this in the context of our topic today. So Renaissance of mercantilism. So late 15th century, um, all of the development that we usually hear about when we talk about the Renaissance, um, <coughs> revival of classic values, humanism, all this great thought, philosophical thought, and this and that. Um, in, in linguistic terms, some of the most important things that were happening at the time were uh, the printing press. Uh, it was introduced by Gutenberg in around 1440. He made it to the English-speaking world a little later, closer to the 1500s, but it was a revolution. Because through the printing press, you now could have redistribution of knowledge, democratization of language, books arriving where they had never arrived before. Uh, not only that, but this was a time when learned, uh, and, and I'm a professor of the, in part of history of the English language, so you will see that I'll, I'll move towards English most of the time. Uh, but what you see is where before Latin and French was the, were the cultured languages, all of a sudden you have English being democratized in Britain and becoming an acceptable language for knowledge, right? Together with that, we had the plague. Marcia made reference to the plague in England, too. Um, we had a bout of plague in the 1300s that would trigger a movement um, that was one of the most important in the English language. Um, and it is, and I'm not kidding you, it was called the Great Vow Shift. It, it looks like a made-up name, but it is true. <laughs> it is what, uh, it was 300 years that gave us a complete change in the vowel system of English, especially of uh, monosyllabic words. And now you know why we have it's the mystery of all mysteries, why we have child and children, for example, right? One went through the great vowel shift, child, because it was monosyllabic, and children didn't, because it was bisyllabic. And so originally we had children, 
and now we have this, you know. So when you go home, start listing all of the words, or one went through the great ball shift and the other didn't. But I digress. It's just a very important uh, element uh, at that time. We have Shakespeare soon after. And so the combination of all of this made for a linguistic revolution. And standardization became a big deal. I can say that people even became a little obsessed with standardization. And that process of being obsessed with standardization kind of only finished right now with texting. Where people are going back to, oh, I'll just write the way, any way I can. Right? But we had a very long period uh, of almost 500 years, or about 500 years, of standardization is the way to go. Right? But with all of this, and all of these new ideas, also came the European expansion, and the idea that it's tr through trade that we're going to make these nations really strong and powerful. Um, and not even all of the humanism and all of the enlightenment that should be taking place prevented this catastrophic historical uh, fact, which is slavery. Like I said, I'm Brazilian, so we have the very shameful uh, title of being the last to, um, to abolish slavery, um, but a very little um, a fact that is known by very few people here in the United States that because Brazil was one of the last, a city was founded in Brazil called Americana, where Americans could go and still have slaves, the ones that could not have slaves in the United States anymore. It's now a thriving city. It became um, a textile center of about 200,000 people. But that's uh, another thing for you to look up uh, at home, the history of American farmers in Brazil after um, slavery was abolished in the United States. And you know, in this climate that you would think is of great thought and advancement, we have this horrible um, human <laughs> catastrophe that names our um, talk today. So in the colonial uh, context, what we have is vernacular languages, these Creoles, um, developing implantations, especially in the 19th century, in the 17th century, I'm sorry, but into the 18th century. Uh, and the lexifier, the language that gave that vocabulary base, um, could be English. It happened in languages such as Gula and Jamaican Creole. Uh, Portuguese, um, and in a language, for example, called Papiamento, Spanish in Palenquero, which is a language, if I'm not mistaken, still spoken in Colombia. Um, French uh, would give us uh, Haitian Creole and Louisiana Creole, um, or a combination of one, uh, more than one of them together. A little historical note here, some researchers actually believe that English in itself is a Creole. Um, having been mixed with Old Norse during the occupation of Britain by Danes. It is very hard to tell apart because the people that had previously invaded the British Isles were of roughly the same origin. And so it's, you know, you have these layers of languages from the same places being imposed on uh, one another. <coughs> and then again, another thing to Google later, if you don't know this yet, Alfred the Great is called the Great because he saved the English language. Um, almost the whole uh, isle, uh, island was um, spoke Old Norse at the point, and from his, um, from his kingdom, he was able to produce lots of uh, written texts and religious texts in English that he spread around the country, used for educational purposes, and English in the end survived. If it weren't for Alfred, we would all right now be speaking Norse. So, um, um, and then this is the point that I'll emphasize once again, despite the history of violence, linguistic violence and otherwise, um, they developed to be full functional languages that serve as markers of identity, belonging, and solidarity. And Creoles, in terms of linguistic potential, are as good as any other language. Okay? I'm a social linguist, so I have to do my little disclaimer here. Um, any language is as good as any other language. And we know this because people communicate in, the, in those languages and they do everything that they have to do in the language perfectly well, right? And so what, does, what differentiates one language from another is the power associated with it. If you have a language uh, that is considered to be uh, powerful, it means that it has strong institutions behind it, sometimes strong army forces behind it, money, all sorts of different sources of power. 
Okay? But in linguistic terms, we cannot say this language, oh, this language is so much better than this language. It, it just doesn't work that way. The same thing with standard language. Standard language is a highly codified language, right? We say what I was telling you, do not split your infinitives. Uh, do not end a sentence with a preposition. Do not use certain verbs in ing form. We have all of those rules that people break all the time. Why do they break it all the time? Because these are just conventionalized to be standard language. They just say to me, oh, but in standard English, it's so much more logical. We don't use double negatives. Well, in standard Portuguese, we do. And there were times in the history of English where double negatives were the rule. And so these are conventions. And whoever has power, institutions, teachers, governments, you know, uh, dictionary writers, grammar book writers, are the folks that decide what's right and what's wrong. Linguistically, if it works, it works. And we do have a lot of inconsistencies that are part of standard language, right? We don't say as part of standard language, um, I am smart, uh, ain't I, not standard language, but I am smart, aren't I, standard language. But we're using a verb of the second person for the first person. How standard is that? It was conventionalized that that's okay to do. Okay? So from our perspective, we look at things descriptively rather than prescriptively. How does it work once people engage with using language, right? And so that's what we do when we're looking at pigeons and creole. How do these work? What are the internal rules? And for any pigeon and creole, especially for creoles, you end up developing this climb of the basilect, mesolect, and acrolect. The more formal language, the intermediate one, and the more informal one. And we, many of us do that too, right? If you have uh, very young uh, kids in your life, you will see that sometimes they talk to you one way, and they talk to their friends another way, and they talk, they write their papers in school yet another way. So you have those three levels represented all the time. And we switch all the time. We just don't realize that we do it. Okay? And we think of language in terms of their potential for strong connections to the one speech community um, and potential for being identity markers and markers of solidarity. Okay, and then I chose one Creole to highlight to you. And I chose the Jamaican Creole because it's one that we're familiar to, with. I'm glad that you know we had references. We didn't plan, but we had references to Jamaican Creole before. It's spoken by about 4 million people. It was developed into the 17th, uh, in the 17th century because of this history of colonization and contact. Uh, it has some level of standardization now because it does have a literature and very rich musical history on its side, and these things really help create a standard. And because of these traditions, uh, there are now positive attitudes uh, towards the Creole, which is the great thing. Yeah. Uh, the population that uses it uh, falls from the Patois, which would be more the base elect, all the way to standard English. And sometimes they will switch between one or the other or the other, depending on the situation of communication. And so now, because I want to surprise you first, and I hope I can do this and then undo it. All right, I'm gonna play something for you to hear. And you can think of this as the, perhaps the interactive portion of the program. Fine. Our I'm going to, like I said, at first, not going to tell you anything other than I'll play this and let you pay attention to it, okay? And then if anybody is willing to volunteer any information about what they hear, it's going to be a little loud, but it has to be. Shame us so you come up and you stand so loud. Not even if the language boy, not even if the twat. I'm your sister. Your sister worked one week with American and she talked so sweet now that we have the juice here, yeah, mister. <laughs> Why you couldn't improve yourself and you get so much pain? You spent six months of foreign and came back ugly same way. <laughs> Not 
not in the trips trousers, not a pastor in the court. Why not in the court, take not a court, she on your throat. Suppose I ask the pastor to introduce to a stranger as we lamented some that lately come from America. They would have laughed after the boy and couldn't tell them so. They would have said, the liars have spent time on my call. Go back and tell the boy you talk too much of him out. I don't know how you and your father are trying to make it out. If you want to please him, make him think you bring back something new. You always call him pa. This evening when you come, say who? On well, the crowd obviously understands. <laughs> Laughing their hearts out. Anybody want to try any guess? Yes? Is that Gullah? No, this is to make it real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's to make it real. Oh, any words? Yeah, right there. Wait, 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 wait. <coughs> yes, yes. You talked about getting an education and, and you may make money and come back, but you still are ugly. Yes, yeah, that part you got. The ugly the same way. Yeah. Yeah. You got. Okay, I'll give you hints. So this is a mother. She's talking to a son. She's not very happy. <laughs> Why is she not happy? Is it hard? Is he getting above himself? Is he? Mm, no. Is she marrying someone she doesn't approve of? Doing something that she doesn't approve of. It has something to do with language. He should uh, improve. He should improve. What, uh, what mean, does... he, he came back just the same. Mm -hmm. He came back just the same. Where did he come back from? He came back from America. And what happened to his language when he came back from America? Nothing. Nothing. He was still <laughs> spoke to make him real. Yeah. Right? And who is it that she thinks did a better job of learning? Sister. His sister. His sister. His sister. What did his sister do? So the sister worked for an American for just one week. Just one week. And she was speaking, quote unquote, better English. Right? But he went for six months and came back the same way. Right? So you, you're good. You're good. Let me see if I show you the. And you were right to say there's, you know, your observation, there's quite a bit of English there. Because remember, again, English is the lexifier. English is the, the language that, that uh, uh, lends you all of the vocabulary. I think we'll do it. I think it just needs to warm up. I think it just needs to warm up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if I can if I can make, make things work here, I'm gonna now show you the words and play at the same time. Let's see if I can do this better. And there's a little bit more of a poem before this, but I don't have the audio for it. Unfortunately, this is the only audio available. This is from uh, Miss Lou. Oh, she was so you come after you stand so long. Not even if... No. She's a famous, she's a very famous poet, Jamaican poet. Right? Um, and, and her interpretation of it is, I think, as important as the, the words themselves. So, here you go. The language war, not even if it's one. I'm your sister. Your sister worked one week with American and she talked so sweet now that we have the juice there at the start. Why oh, you couldn't improve yourself and you get so much pay? You spend six months of foreign and come back on the same way. <laughs> not even a tree of trousers. Not a pastor in the court. Why not even a goat? Teach not a goat, she on your throat. Suppose I ask the pastor to introduce to a stranger as we lamented some that lately come from America. They would have laughed after the boy and couldn't tell them so. They would have said, Lila, you must have spent time on my <laughs> Go back and tell the boy you talk too much of him out. I don't know how you and your father are to make it out. If you want to please him, make him think you bring back something new. You always call him Pa. This evening when you come, say, who? <laughs> All right, so what does she want the son to do since he cannot speak American? He wants to trick her, his father by. You got that part at the end? 
Yeah, just invent things. Just invent a word, you know? Yeah. You always call him pa. Yeah. When you come home, say boo. <laughs> and then you think that that's an American word. <laughs> but what I love about this poem is that in a, in a reversed way, I think she poses the big question of, of, of language, right? Um, are you the language that you speak? And um, I, I think that she actually means the opposite of everything that she's saying, right? I think that this is actually an ode to Jamaican Creole yeah. and the absurdity of having to leave to become something better rather than being your language, being your identity, being the language of solidarity with your goal. Right? That's why I leave you with this funny but I think important. It's poignant, that's a, a good word. Followed by Ms. Lou, and I'll be happy to answer any questions with my colleagues. Thank you very much.